No, yeah, it's not daily, unfortunately. Sorry, it's gonna take me one second. I thought I had it. I must have I must have closed it. Um okay, so yeah, I had so yeah, like Patrick said, anyone can present at these, and I've been itching to present at kind of my favorite topic of late. Um and yeah, I didn't know, even though I guess I could have looked at the calendar and known they were certifying the votes, I didn't realize there was going to be such a dramatic day uh, in terms of, you know, right wing violence and organization. And it's uh, scary, but I decided to go through with my uh, original presentation, partially, you know, to honor the guy that I'm talking about, because he spent his whole career kind of warning about this sort of thing. He was a labor leader. Um, from the 50s to the to the end of his life in 2002 and so he really you know he was riding the decline of labor unfortunately and so he was always saying that if the corporate if the corporations keep winning and if there isn't some real alternative um you know really really dangerous politics are gonna come on the scene and so he did not live to see Trump, but I don't think he would have been that surprised. So I, I thought I would stick with my presentation and that I'll share my screen. Um, okay, let's see. All right. So yeah, you are at Red Square, everyone. Um, presentation on Tony Mizaki. Um, so, so let's get started with a little question. Um, so uh, yeah, so who knows uh, which president signed the Occupational Health and Safety Act into law? You can type it in the chat. All right, <laughs> Chris isn't allowed to answer. No, just... um, yeah, so Nixon did. Uh, yeah, so let's see. Yeah, so Richard Nixon, um, anti-Semite, bigot, crook, and not really a big friend of labor. Um, so let's, um, oops, sorry. Oops, sorry, guys. Yeah, so Nixon surely didn't sign OSHA out of the kindness of his heart. Um, yeah, we can be pretty sure of that, you know. Uh, so, but he did actually sign some pretty big landmark environmental legislation. You know, he signed the Clean Air Act, um, the Endangered Species Act, among others, and yeah, the occupational safety, some stuff related to EPA. I'm kind of forgetting. I like glanced at a big list on, uh, I forget, yeah. But um, the, yeah, so, and then, so yeah, like I, and then also the one that we started off with the Occupational Safety and Health Act, um, which you might not necessarily think of as an environmental regulation, but if you didn't think of it as an env environmental regulation, um, you can be forgiven. So yeah, the Occupational Safety and Health Act is act to assure safe and healthful working conditions for women and men, working women and men, set up, setting up OSHA, signed on December 29th, 1970. So I didn't realize until I made this presentation that we just passed the 50th anniversary of that bill. Um, but yeah, so you can be forgiven if you didn't think of OSHA as like an environmental reg legislation. Um, you know, uh, a lot of the early environmental movement, you know, they might have placed the blame of like pollution on industry, but they didn't necessarily like loop in the whole fact that workers are the people who are the most exposed to industrial pollutants. So, um, you know, here's this one of these famous kind of DDT trucks uh, spraying chemicals. And we now know maybe that uh, eagles have their eggs like messed up by this chemical. But, you know, as you can see, there's also people driving the truck. They probably exposed, you know, how many 40, 60, 80 hours a week 
uh, to these chemicals. So it's a lot. Um, so yeah, Silent Spring came out and kind of galvanized the early environmental movement and sort of represented this politics of like, you know, consumer and kind of like focus on um, the impacts on the environment, but with like a glaring blind spot of like the workers and how they're interacting with the chemicals. Um, so yeah, Silent Spring written by Rachel Carson really looked to as kind of like one of these flashpoints of the environmental movement. And yeah, Tony Mazzocchi read Silent Spring and he like, he knew, he's like, one thing's missing here, y'all, the worker. Um, so yeah, that's the connection, OSHA, environmentalism, Tony Mazzocchi. Okay, so who is, was Tony Mazzocchi? Um, in a, he was kind of one of the first labor leaders that uh, really connected kind of the social movements of the 60s, especially environmental activism uh, to the labor movement. And yeah, he ended up using that organizing to be a driving organizer and visionary behind OSHA. So yeah, his early life, he straight out of uh, Red Brooklyn, um, you know, back in the 20s and 30s, there were a ton of communists in Brooklyn and lower Manhattan. Um, and yeah, he was born into that melting pot, um, really kind of like grew up in it. Um, his mother died when he was really young and the, of cancer and their medical bills caused them to lose their house. So he grew up in this boarding house with his grandma and he just sat around the dinner table every day with his um, communist party sisters and uncle and his militant trade unionist father and like a rotating cast of just like radical borders, like unionists. Um, you know, lots of, and then, um, and then, yeah, he was a high school dropout, uh, but ultimately, you know, he proved to be just kind of this like organic intellect, working class intellectual, which is really inspiring. Um, and then he, or he, he took up reading actually while he was in World War II. He dropped out of high school and enlist, lied about his age so that he could enlist to go fight Nazis. And after he was out, he got to um, live for one year on $20 payments from the government and $20 weekly payments from the government, uh, which was referred to as the 52 Club. And so, yeah, he never forgot that ease uh, that he felt during that time. And later in his career, he'll look to the GI Bill as like something that we should try to emulate, but like not have to actually uh, you know, risk your life for. <laughs> um, okay, so we, so um, he really, or so after the war, after his uh, money started running out, um, he started looking to get into industry. Um, and also around this time, he was hanging out with Communist Party folks, uh, but he was never in the Communist Party as far as we know. Um, and but his communist connections did get him this job at a cosmetics factory uh, on this kind of quirky mission to get revenge on um, one of the labor leaders there had like sold out one of a communist party guy. Um, Cause this was actually, you know this was the height of the red square at this time. Um, you know, the red, or I said red square, oops. The red scare at this time after the war uh, which for those of you who don't know, the Red Scare was a capitalist offensive to sever labor from the left. Um, so yeah, if you, you know, you could really screw somebody over by being like, that guy's a communist and then you get to take his job. So he was a communist though and the communists wanted to get revenge on him um, and they sent Tony in to do it because they knew he was kind of like a natural born organizer. Um, but then once he got there, he saw the conditions on the ground and realized that what was best for the workers in this like truly like incredibly organized shop, they had pretty recently won their union and they, had, they just had like a lot of solidarity. And um, he, he realized what was best for the unions and the labor movement as a whole during this like horrible red scare time was just to um, kind of ignore that mission and keep 
keep fighting for that union. Um, so yeah, he pretty much immediately became a trusted organizer. And then only a little over two years later, he was elected president of that local, um, which was a local of the United Gas, Coke and Chemical Workers. And he ran on a platform of equal pay for equal work, which props to Tony uh, pretty, pretty early for, you know, equal pay for women. Um, okay, so his whole career, I mean, he was basically working up until he died in 2002 and he was officially in the labor movement to like the nineties. And so he only spent this like sliver of time actually on the shop floor. Cause once he was elected to um, be president of the local that was like a paid labor leader position. And after that he was in, you know staff roles his entire, the rest of his career. And yeah, so the name of his biography is actually the man who hated work and loved labor. And it's just this incredible title and I love it because I'm like, same, but you know, your aversion to alienated labor can like Tony bind you to the working class rather than uh, lead you to cast your lot in with the leisure class. Uh, like, you know, a lot of labor leaders um, today and in that time too. Uh, so yeah, just like quickly, you know, labor leaders are structurally conservatized by their material conditions, which can be different than workers. Um, so yeah, a lot of, a lot of them, you know, they don't like to work and they don't want to, they don't associate with the shop floor workers, but they don't take that as like a sign to fight for the working class. They're just kind of like chill with their salaries. And maybe they write articles shitting on Medicare for all, like Randy Weingarten, president of AFT this year. Um, unlike Randy Weingarten, Tony's interests always stayed with the working class. Um, yeah. Couldn't help myself get a little dig in. Uh, so yeah, so how, um, because this is Red Square and I'm already kind of like running over time, uh, I just wanted to like, uh, I'll, the organ, I'm, I'm not gonna go into all of this stuff on this slide, but I wanted to include like a slide of just like highlights, a highlight reel, mostly to entice you to read the book because like every page of the book is like actually action packed and you didn't even know it was that exciting to be a labor organizer but like yeah like and it's it's just really inspiring and exciting uh but yeah in his first decade he fought like hell for rank and file democracy won a bunch of cool reforms that like are still relevant today that we should think about and fight for um if you're in the labor movement he made his local a fixture on the picket line supporting other unions uh which happened to scare the pants off of the managers uh in his in their shop um he heroically added a ton of other shops to their local uh even going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the mob um they they had a big merger with oil workers to form ocaw oil chemical and atomic workers and throughout this whole time uh one thing that shines through is that he's always encouraging this kind of like independent working class scholarship um in work in working class intellectualism around him um, so he's constantly reading, even though he's working these like grueling organizing shifts, never home really, but he always has like a, a bunch of books and he's always handing them out to the people around him. Like, um, these other, you know, high school dropouts or like high school education havers, um, always encouraging people to read, which is good, good trait. Um, so yeah, back to OSHA, like I started with. So like I said, he was influenced by Silent Spring. He was like, hey, workers are missing from this. Um, and he um, and he had already been involved with like some environmental organizing in his early days in the union because um, there were atomic workers in the union. So like he had done various things with that. He was very, uh, very concerned about the exposure to radiation as one should be. Um, and then, yeah, in 1965, he became a legislative staffer for the, the union, OCAW. And his, he, I mean, he was really able to win this like huge landmark legislation because you can see it through like his theory of change in that like he, 
he really hated lobbying. Like he was basically a lobbyist. He could have just like basically talked to powerful people all day, but he hated that. He wasn't a closed door meeting kind of guy. So instead, and he believed, you know, workers would actually have the power to force somebody like Nixon to sign in this important law only if they were organized. So he spent his like, you know, resources and time in that role, uh, organizing these education, um, organizing trips around the country. He would bring in um, chemists and doctors and uh, biologists and stuff to go like educate the workers on like what, like what the exposures were like, you know, what those were doing to them, what they could do to protect themselves and how they should like demand that from their employer. And then, you know, and then he actually trained those workers to then lobby Congress. So, you know, he was able to really put together like a legit movement of environmentalists and workers and was able to get a reactionary like Nixon to sign this important legislation. So yeah, when you build a big movement down below, regardless of who's in the White House, you can bring about change. So pretty important for us to remember today, obviously, you know, we none of us, think that Biden is like the second coming of FDR and you know he's going to be pretty hard to push anyway but yeah if you have a big enough movement like we can get things to happen so lessons for environmental organizers and socialists um you know don't forget about the workers they are at the forefront of exposure but most importantly they have the power to stop it um workers are smart they should be, you know, part of the complex science and stuff going into like climate change and environmental organizing. They can understand it. Uh, yeah, we can never write them off. Um, and yeah, a third point, capitalists want us to think that pollution and climate change are an individual problem. They've spent a ton of PR dollars into making us think this. Um, and so, yeah, we can't play into their hands. Uh, the real solution, collective working class education, organizing and action. And through unions, um, unions it turns out are a really good way to deliver education to workers. Cause you know, it's like a trusted place. You're already like there. Yeah, I don't know, you're, yeah. Read the book, <laughs> no, just sorry. Was Tony a socialist? Um, yeah, basically, I mean, but he was like a really important labor leader during the Cold, Cold War. So, you know, he wasn't very open about it um and when he was asked he'd be like huh that's a great idea someone should try that sometime um but you know that's one thing that we should definitely take not take for granted today that uh more and more we can openly identify as socialists and that's good because you need lots of people identifying as socialists to like infect more people but yeah so yeah this is a quote from tony mizaki that i think really shows his socialist way of thinking about things um it was the workers in these industries who taught me that there was a systematic conflict between profits and health when you start thinking that when you start to interfere with the forces of production you're going to the heart of the beast visionary organizing for our class so yeah like tony just had a vision of you know working class control of society um maximum free time for the whole working class. He had gotten a little taste of that with the GI Bill and really saw that as a good idea. And, you know, he also believed in like free college. Um, yeah, he basically believed, you know, workers should be able to do what, what the frick they want with their free time and not be limited by, you know, too many hours at work and cost of like things like education. Um, he believed that work uh, shouldn't kill you prematurely or harm you such that you can barely enjoy your life. Um, which, uh, yeah, was a really interesting thing for me to think about as somebody who's always been like in environmental kind of like science and stuff. It's interesting. I mean, there's some crap on earth that probably should never be handled by human hands. Uh, we can get into the atomic debate later if you want, um, but you know, exposing people to atomic radiation is really fucking bad. <laughs> and it's really hard to not have that at any point of the like production process. Um, so maybe there's some stuff that we shouldn't ever profit off of as like a species or as capitalists. Um, and then there's some stuff that you could imagine maybe is like harmful to handle, but like maybe we need it. Maybe it's this insane, like important medicine, but like exposure to it, like 
is bad. Well, that doesn't really make sense. I guess with like chemotherapy. Well, you can imagine a substance that is like bad to handle in like certain, if you're like working all day and night with it, but is like important to have or something. And in that case, like workers should have like weird working arrangements. Tony had like all sorts of interesting visions of like, um, like people should work like one week on and then a bunch of weeks off to like detox, you know? which makes sense for biology, but does not make sense under capitalism. Capitalism don't do that shit. Like, um, yeah, it's all about, you know, organizing for profit of a few people. Um, so what was I gonna, that, yeah. And, and then ultimately he believed that the only way to do this was to organize um, as a class. And he believed that a party was the way to achieve it. Um, a working class party. And he believed that the only uh, way to even have a working class party was through like the labor movement. Um, so yeah, that's, that's it. Uh, sounds pretty socialist to me. Um, and I just wanted to plug it for my last slide. I do think socialists should read biographies. You know, I was really skeptical for a while of like great man theory of history. And like, obviously I still am, but like, um, you know, people it are like important and it's weird how much people influence history and like reading their biographies is basically like the best way to like see those insights and weird things that happened to them that made them do the things that they did. Um, so yeah, read biographies even of old dead white guys, maybe this guy. Um, all right, um, that's it. Thank you. Stop share. Um, can't find a, a stop share. I can never find it. All right. So yeah, we can talk about anything. We could totally scuttle that and